In previous lessons, we learned about this list of characteristics that all living things share. And we also learned that this one here in bold, that living things reproduce and show heredity, which is passing on traits from parents to offspring, that that characteristic is a modern understanding. For thousands of years, people believed in a process called spontaneous generation. For example, the ancient uh, Greeks uh, and Romans believed that dead bull flesh could spontaneously generate into bees. So if spontaneous generation was real, then it's not like we have heredity going on here. The dead flesh turning into bees, the bees don't really have parents that are bee-like, as it were. Now, how would this happen? Uh, lots of folks for thousands of years thought nature had a vital force, some kind of power out there that could interact with non-living materials in the soil to produce all kinds of creatures like insects. And again, if this caterpillar uh, spontaneously emerged from the soil, the caterpillar did not really have parents that were passing on caterpillar-like traits. Finally, in the 1600s, Francisco Reddy put spontaneous generation to the test in a simple experiment. Take a look at the left side of the diagram here. We have two conditions, a jar that is open uh, and with meat in, in both jars here. And there was, it was commonly believed that meat could spontaneously generate into worms. The idea would be some vital force interacted with the dead meat to spontaneously generate worms. Francisco Reddy had other ideas. He carefully observed the situation and found that flies would often land on the meat. And then he saw little ovals, fly eggs, and these eggs hatched into larvae. The worms were really fly larvae. And so that would be the source of these worms. So to test this idea, we might imagine making a, a condition like this. We put a lid on the jar, and sure enough, when you put a lid on the jar that has meat, you get no worms. But we have a problem here. So the jar lid is blocking the flies from getting to the meat, but it's also denying or preventing fresh air from getting to the meat. And so the spontaneous generation crowd could say, well, you get no worms here because you didn't have the vital force getting to the meat. You do get worms over here because the vital force got to the meat. So the cleverness of Reddy was to set up a, another condition where he was able to block the flies with a cloth, but that cloth would allow air into the jar. If there really was a vital force, uh, we should find worms in this condition, but he always found no worms. So Reddy takes this as evidence that there is no spontaneous generation of meat into worms. Rather, worms are coming from flies landing on the meat and laying eggs. Now, while this type of experiment did convince many in the late 1600s that meat does not spontaneously generate into worms, many at the time still believed that cells might spontaneously generate. Those tiny little microbes that recently discovered with microscopes. You'll recall bacteria are the smallest and simplest types of cells on Earth, and you need microscopes to observe them. So why did people believe that bacteria could spontaneously generate? Well, it had to do with a series of experiments in the late 1700s. And often they involved having a flask with some broth in it, like chicken broth. And this would just be nutrients to feed any living cells. But of course, these nutrients that would feed living cells presumably would also be the exact kind of stuff you need to spontaneously generate new cells. So this broth was the kind of stuff that scientists thought might spontaneously generate into living cells, and then the broth could feed any living cells that did emerge. Now, if you want to demonstrate spontaneous generation, you first then have to uh, eliminate uh, any living things from the broth. But again, the idea is if, if there is a vital force in nature, that vital force then would be able to interact with this non-living broth to produce life cells. So let's take a look at uh, a, a kind of experiment that uh, scientists did in the late 1700s. First, you take your broth and you have to boil the broth just to make sure you're killing all of the bacteria. Again, if you want to demonstrate spontaneous generation, you have to start with non-living stuff. So you boil to kill any life in the broth. And to confirm that you've boiled your broth long enough, you're going to take a sample of the broth and check. And you better find no bacteria. right? So if you find bacteria, you need to keep boiling. So this is what scientists would do. They would boil the broth and then take, and take a sample or two and check. And if they found no bacteria, then they would cork up the flask. Of course, you want to prevent any outside contamination. So the presumption was this fluid here, this broth, had no living cells in it, no bacteria. 
But if you wait a few days and then take a sample and put it under the microscope, they found bacteria. They concluded that spontaneous generation happened. Now, by the 1800s, there were critics of the earlier experiments. So people like Louis Pasteur, uh, using a microscope like this, argued that bacteria could travel on dust particles and settle onto any surface or drift into any opening. And so Pasteur is going to be criticizing this procedure in a number of ways. First, he could argue that this boiling procedure did not kill all the bacteria. And remember, to confirm that they killed bacteria, they simply just checked with a couple of samples. Well, what if they missed any living bacteria in those samples? In addition, this quirking procedure might not really be a good procedure to prevent outside contamination. You have to put the cork on, there might be a bad seal here, and then to check the sample later, you're going to have to remove the cork, which would expose the flask to the air. So Pasteur had lots of criticisms of these earlier experiments. For Pasteur, what he thought was going on was either the boiling process was not sufficient or somehow dust with bacteria hitching a ride was entering the flask and colonizing the fluid down here. And once living cells got down into the broth then, they would use the broth as nutrition, they would reproduce, cells would reproduce, said Pasteur, and that's why you would find bacteria in the broth. Now, Pasteur is going to do a, a clever set of experiments that will be featured in the next lesson, but his ultimate conclusion is that uh, spontaneous generation does not happen. And he was very persuasive in, in putting the final nail in the coffin of this idea of spontaneous generation. Now, this uh, he was working in the mid-1800s. You'll recall that also in the 1800s, other scientists were observing animal development. Using frog uh, eggs, They uh, people like Robert Remack and others uh, literally directly observed one fertilized egg cell splitting, dividing into two cells. And then in time, those two cells would be dividing into four cells. And so uh, the same was found in plants as well. It, it became clear that the cells of an animal or a plant come from pre-existing cells. So whether it's bacteria or whether it's in animals and plants, cells do not seem to be spontaneously generating. They are emerging from pre-existing cells. So our, that was our third pillar of the cell theory. Cells come from other cells. They do not spontaneously generate. Now, there is one giant exception to this sort of principle, and that would be the origin of life itself. So scientists believe some four and a half billion years ago, the Earth took shape, and initially there was no life on Earth. Well, four and a half billion years later, there's lots of life on Earth. The key step, say modern scientists, was the emergence of cells. The first living organisms would be tiny, simple, single-celled organisms, similar to the bacterial cells that we're familiar with today. Well, if that's the case, then this would be an example of spontaneous generation, that non-living chem chemicals assembled into the first living cell. But once these cells emerged, on planet Earth, it was reproduction with heredity for the next four billion years to produce all the living things on Earth today.